Good morning and welcome to the Baltic Sea Center at Stockholm University uh, in this webinar where we'll be talking about long-term structural changes in the Baltic Sea environment with a focus on food webs. My name is Charles Barakov. I'm a policy officer at the Baltic Sea Center. Uh, the Baltic Sea Center mission is in part to try and bridge the gap between science and policy and also to stimulate uh, the development of um, Baltic Sea environmental research and outreach at Stockholm University and other departments. Um, we have uh, five main topics that we work on. There's eutrophication, biodiversity, climate change, fisheries and contaminants. We have uh, uh, conduct our own research and we also have uh, research infrastructure that we make available to others as a, a, a research station, vessels. We also follow policy developments and do a lot of communication in different ways, including this series of Baltic Sea Breakfast, Baltic Breakfast webinars and seminars. <coughs> uh, today, <coughs> we're going to be talking, <coughs> as I said, about the long-term environmental changes and impacts on food webs and things like in particular, uh, and we'll also try and answer questions from the audience, so you can send questions to us by email at ustushucentrum at su.se, or by Slido with the code 22102, and these should both be visible in the, um, uh, on your screens. Uh, if you write uh, who you are and where you're from, uh, then we might be able to contact you also afterwards if um, there's something that we want to talk with you about that happens. So <coughs> when we're going to be talking about uh, food webs, we mentioned food webs instead of food chains as an indication that the interactions between the different species are much more complex than the linear chain would suggest. You could say f in one way that we've been doing a full-scale field experiment with environmental changes in the Baltic Sea over a number of decades, pumping in a lot of uh, fertilizer into the sea, a lot of um, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And these can have, uh, have are having uh, implications for the environment, but sometimes you need to take a big step backwards to see these changes and to see what the implications are for different things. And that's what we're doing today. We're going to be looking at the long-term impacts of these changes from the point of view of the food webs. And to, to help us learn more about that, we have two researchers currently working at the Baltic Sea Center. Uh, Eva Arnstein uh, presented her dissertation. Uh, on uh, biomass and carbon processing on seafloor animals at Helsinki University in the year 2020. So it's quite recent. Uh, and she'll be telling us more about the changes in the seafloor animals during the past 50 years. Uh, Maciej Tomczak is a marine ecologist who's been working, uh, doing research at the Baltic Sea Center for the over more than 10 years now. That's right. Yeah. Uh, and he's the lead author of a recently published major article about structural shifts in the Baltic Sea environment, uh, affecting many species, looking both at the, what's happening in the sea floor and the water column, uh, and for a longer period of time. Um, and he'll be telling us more about these researches and the consequences and implications for management. So we'll start with Eva. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Charles. Um, Yes, so um, I will be telling you about research related to my thesis that I did in collaboration between Stockholm University and the University in Helsinki, but also other research uh, uh, that I've been involved in relating to uh, changes in benthic fauna over the past decades. So benthic fauna, that are the animals that live on or in the seafloor. They are an important tool for management because they are used in environmental monitoring. Uh, because they are relatively long-lived and sedentary, they don't move around very much. They show kind of the accumulated effects of their environment. The, they also affect the recycling of nitrogen, phosphorus and carbon uh, at the seafloor, for example, by eating and mixing the sediments. 
Uh, and this has many important implications for large-scale processes such as eutrophication and climate change. Uh, they are also food for fish, such as, for example, flash, flatfish uh, and cod. Um, the Baltic Sea is a challenging place to live in for these critters uh, because of the low salinity that really restricts the number of species that can survive in this sea. And on the left-hand uh, map, you can see the distribution limits of some marine species. So, for example, we see that starfish and crabs are almost missing completely from the Baltic Sea. Uh, and for those species that live in the sea, they face physiological challenges that can, for example, affect their growth. So in this photo here, you see on the right side uh, a blue mussel from the Atlantic, and from on the left side a blue mussel uh, from the Baltic Sea. And uh, this shows quite clearly why it's not really viable to have commercial shellfish uh, uh, farms in the Baltic. Another challenge in the Baltic Sea is the eutrophication. So the sea has been heavily affected by nutrient inputs since about the 1950s. Uh, and these mean that there have been more phytoplankton or more algal blooms, as you see in this picture here. Uh, and when these algae die and sink to the bottom, they actually become food for this benthic fauna. Uh, but at the same time, when the sinking organic matter is degraded, uh, it leads in the deeper parts of the sea to oxygen depletion, or so-called dead bottoms. Uh, and in the map here, we see how these oxygen depleted areas uh, have expanded from the beginning of the 1900s uh, to the very vast areas we see today. Uh, so then we asked ourselves, we have these two opposite effects on the fauna. So what has really happened then? Uh, and to look at this, we did a modeling study where we looked at large scale changes from 1970 uh, to about today in the area you see on this map. Uh, and what we found was indeed there have been losses uh, in the deep areas, uh, but there have also been increases in the shallow areas. Uh, and when we take all of these together, we can see that the total amount or biomass of fauna has increased by about 50% from 1970 to about the 1990s and then stayed kind of stable after that. If we look a little bit more into detail uh, in the second graph, you can see that most of the increase has happened in the Baltic proper, uh, while in the Botnian Bay, naturally, there are very little fauna uh, and there is no trend in this area. <coughs> uh, with this kind of large-scale modeling, we can't say very much about what happens with individual species. So instead, I would like to talk a little bit about another project I've been involved in. Um, uh, where we did a red list of, of habitat types or ecosystems uh, along the Finnish coast. And there we looked at monitoring data of benthic fauna to see the changes that has happened over the last 50 years. Uh, and what we saw was, well, there were very large variations between different stations and also between different years. Uh, but there are still some common trends. So some species that mostly have been increasing are the Baltic telin, uh, Makoma. This seems to be a very sturdy species that can tolerate many different uh, environments and it's really been benefiting from this increase in food supply. Uh, then another species complex are the Marencelleria worms. So these are three different species that were found in the Baltic Sea for the first time in, in the 1980s. They probably came with sh ship traffic and since, since then they have been uh, spreading throughout the sea. And as many invasive species, they show this kind of boom and bust dynamics. So when they come into a new place, they first increase a lot, then they decrease again and kind of settle uh, on a more stable level. Then some of the species that have been decreasing in the past decades are this amphipod, Monoporeia. Uh, this species is very sensitive to oxygen depletion but uh, it's also been decreasing drastically in areas where we have good oxygen conditions. And we don't know exactly why this is. Uh, it could uh, have to do with toxic effects on reproduction, for example, polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Uh, it's also been suggested it might be related to changes in, in the spring bloom of phytoplankton. So there might have been changes in the food quality rather than the food quantity. Uh, another set of species, 
uh, have been decreasing are the river mussels. These are freshwater species that live mostly in estuaries and bays, and for them the story is quite different. So they are very sensitive to things like coastal construction and, and changes in forestry. Uh, a final example for the blue mussel, we couldn't find any significant trends in the past. Um, but when we look into the future, it's very possible that salinity decline and acidification will pose uh, serious problems for this species. Then we have an example from the Swedish side, uh, from the Asko area. Uh, and here we can see how the, the composition of fauna has changed. So if we start to look at the 1970s, if you took a sample from the seafloor, about 9 out of 10 uh, individuals would be this Monoporeia. Then Monoporeia crashed, uh, the Baltic Tellin came in uh, or, or increased a lot. Uh, and in the early 2000s, here in yellow, you see how these invasive Marenzelleria species came into the system. So the situation we have today is a very different composition of fauna compared to what we had in the 70s. And what are then the consequences of all these changes? Uh, for example, for eutrophication. We know that benthic fauna can both increase and decrease the release of nutrients from the seafloor that then again uh, fuel uh, primary production and eutrophication. There have been studies on this invasive Marenzelleria, and some show that they increase the fluxes of phosphorus from the seafloor, some show that they decrease. Uh, we have a recent study with my colleagues, still not published, where we, uh, that seems to suggest that the net effect of having more fauna on the seafloor is reduced eutrophication. But this is very complex and it really seems to depend on what you look at and where you look. Then how about the food for fish and birds? Well, the Baltic tellin that has been increasing a lot is eaten by, for example, flatfish, gobies, eider ducks and gooseanders. And it is possible that the increase in flounder that we've seen lately uh, could be related to more uh, benthic food. Cod, on the other hand, prefers to eat crustaceans like monoporeia that has been decreasing and saduria, for which we don't really know what has happened. Uh, but for cod, it's also or maybe mainly driven by other factors than food, such as fishing or reproductive conditions. I think my colleague will talk more about this in a while. So to summarize, we can say that inputs of nutrients and harmful substances have shifted the distribution and composition of the seafloor communities to kind of a more productive state dominated by more tolerant species. But the consequences for the rest of the ecosystem remain largely unclear. Uh, then I would like to take uh, a minute more to talk a little bit about the future. So going back to the modeling study I showed in the very beginning, you see here on the right hand side, you see in grey the historical development of benthic fauna, the one I already showed you. Uh, and then we did different future scenarios where we looked in red. Um, if we increase nutrient loads, uh, we probably will have more fauna in the future. If nutrient loads are decreased according to the Baltic Sea Action Plan, the amount of fauna will decrease. But also if we keep uh, loads at the level of today, we also see a decrease in benthic fauna. Then we added climate change scenarios to the picture and it becomes a little bit more complicated. So what we see here in the lower right hand graph uh, is that when the sea becomes warmer, according to this model study at least, uh, the phytoplankton gets recycled much faster in the water column and this means that less of the organic matter sinks down to the bottom uh, so there will be less food for the fauna. Um, and looking at these scenarios might look a little bit worrying. Will, be, will we be losing all the benthic fauna? Will there be no food for, for uh, flatfish in the future? But actually this is more of a return to the levels of the 1920s. So there is a classical study from the Gotland area um, where we have some information about how much fauna there was in the 1920s and how much there was in the 1970s. And the difference here between is about the same as we see here in these future scenarios. So to conclude, inputs of nutrients have increased the amount of benthic fauna despite extinctions uh, in these expanding oxygen-free areas. 
There have been changes in composition. There's been an increase of the Baltic Tallinn, an invasion, invasion of Marenceleria, and a decrease of Monophorea. Consequences for the rest of the ecosystem are not very well known. Uh, and in the future, we can expect that reduced nutrient inputs and climate change probably will reduce the amount of fauna in the future. So with this, I would like to thank you and of course all my colleagues and financers. Okay, and thank you very much, Eva. Uh, did I understand correctly that there's some kind of a feedback uh, when it comes to eutrophication between uh, the impacts of eutrophication on the fauna and then what the fauna, what, how th that can have impacts on the consequence of eutrophication for other species? Is there some kind of a feedback there that like the, 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 the changes in the, 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 the benthic fauna? Uh, so you mean that uh, with, with eutrophication we have changes in the benthic fauna? Yeah. Uh, and because these are, for example, food for other parts of the system. Yeah. Uh, uh, changes in, in, in uh, benthic fauna, of course, has also might have effects for, for fish and birds. But these we don't know very well. Uh, then another part is also that we really we have a cycling of these nutrients, uh, and so what happens with the fauna at the seafloor also has consequences for how much of the nutrients that sink down to the bottom that are returned to to recycling. Y yeah, uh, so that it can reinforce the the impacts or 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 dampen the impacts, and we really don't know which is the main. Exactly. So it seems to depend a little bit. Uh, it's it's very complex. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. chemical processes and physical processes involved uh, but it, yeah, it seems to li like it can go both ways uh, but we, pr we think that probably more fauna uh, it gives a negative feedback loop so we will have less nutrients so it's uh, kind of good for eutrophication in a way you could say. Okay, okay. And you mentioned also acidification, the, the consequences from that. That's the result of climate change, yeah? Exactly. So um, acidification uh, is uh, something that happens when the CO2 levels in the atmosphere rise. Uh, then some of this uh, gets dissolved uh, in the sea, and this makes the sea more acidic. Uh, the consequences, I think there was actually a breakfast on this uh, mm -hmm. last year where they talked a little bit about, and the, the kind of the positive thing for the Baltic Sea is that the level of acidity or the pH is naturally quite variable. So this means that the species that live in the Baltic Sea are probably kind of pre-adapted uh, to, to uh, tolerate these changes. But if we go far enough in the future, and if we believe in the more uh, pessimistic uh, scenarios, then this will definitely be a problem. And this will be a prob problem, especially for the species that have uh, calcium shells, so like uh, bivalves, mussels, and clams. Okay, thanks a lot. That's uh, really fascinating. Uh, and when you said at the very end that you'd gone back and compared things the way that they were in the 1920s, then that's sort of like a nice, uh, uh, nice uh, uh, change to what Mach is going to be talking about that uh, has to do with more long term, because the research that you're going to be talking about is, is both looking at more components of the ecosystem and over a longer time period, as I understand it. Absolutely. Thank you, Charles. Uh, thank you, Eva, for for your talk. Uh, yes, uh, the last time when I talked for the Baltic breakfast, uh, well, I, I talked about the, the future of the Baltic Sea. I think you can still find this movie uh, on, the, uh, on the Baltic Sea Center YouTube. Uh, but today I would like to talk about the past, the past of the Baltic Sea ecosystem. The reference state, the structure, the regime shift and regulatory drivers in the Baltic Sea ecosystem. This study has been recently published in uh, Limnology and Oceanography uh, with a uh, number of uh, colleagues from Germany, Sweden, Denmark and Finland. So it's, it's, it's very, uh, it's very, it's study compile number of the information, not only, uh, not only dealing with, with, one single, uh, with one single organism. Our study area comp uh, focus on the Central Baltic Sea, so Borholm and the Gotland Basin, and you can see on the, on the left-hand side. And we look at the, at the Baltic food web. As Charles introduced, is practically everything from 
from bottom to the surface, from primary producers like phytoplankton, through the small fish, top predators like cod and seals, and fisheries. And we're asking the question, is the Baltic the same sea as 100 years ago, or is completely different, different sea? And that's, of course, have an implication for management. I will answer this question right away. No, it's a completely different sea. It's a completely different system. We cannot even compare, really, the current, uh, the current Baltic food web with what we have in the past. I will start from, from the conclusion and describe how we get there. So, the Baltic being oligotrophic system right now is uh, it's eutrophic. And that was a uh, regime shift from the inotrophic state, from productive to the, uh, from low productive to the high productive system. Right now there is a different pathways transferring the energy from the primary producers to the top predators. There is a strong pelagic benthic coupling. So the interactions between the creatures living in the, in the water and the benthos was, was much stronger. And of course what's changed is what control these dynamics. And Previously, in the past period, that was a salinity, right now is oxygen. And what is very important that the eutrophication process we observed in the Baltic have not only the consequences at the you know, phytoplankton or, or zooplankton, it's reached much higher trophic level, so the consequences are much broader. And that, of course, have an implication for the management, but for that I will go at the very end. We can compare different pictures from the, from the Baltic, from the 80s, like with this big cot we have on the left-hand side, and with this small, small boats full of, uh, full of flatfish from the German coast uh, in, the, in the 20s or 30s. That, of course, looks very, very different. But is it only the development of the society and fishing techniques, for example, or is it the changes in the, in the ecosystem? We answer here that this is mainly the ecosystem changes. So the system changed from the low production to the high production system, from oxic to the hypoxic, with a number of a different periods characterized in a different way. And I will come back to it in a, f in a, in a second. In the very beginning, I would like to basically tell you which that is very important to look not only in a short term window, if we talk about the ecosystem, because the ecosystem dynamic have a much longer period of, uh, mm, of recovery, longer response period. We used to look at the uh, data, f data, mm, data which s usually starting at 70s, sometimes at 50s. But if we look at the reconstructions and other information we got about the oxygen on the top or the salinity, we see that the system changed and there was a period of the high oxygen and low oxygen or the high salinity and the low, low salinity depend on the depend on the type. Also with the eutrophication, if we look only on the window from the 70s, it's not really, it's not really what the Baltic was previously. There was a huge increase since, since uh, 40s. And also the fish, the famous cod have the peak in the, in the, in the, in the, in the 80s, but what about the rest? Also the flounder, Right now it's increasing, but was very low. But that was time also when the flounder biomass was very high. So we have to really look at the complex changes at the system to say something what, what the ecosystem is. In this study, we compile number of historical uh, data series based on reconstruction and the modeling studies to characterize how the food web change. We use the biomasses of fish, bentos, uh, seals, but also phytoplankton, and the number of uh, environmental time series, like different salinities, temperatures, uh, oxygen, hypoxic area, and cod reproductive volume. We put those data into the multivariate statistics to see the interactions between variables. And if we look for the entire period, from the 1925 to the 2005, so eight years, uh, we see dynamic between the, oh, sorry, between the cod and sprat, as we suppose that predator and prey. But that's also the 
change uh, that's also the interactions between the productivity related variables like phytoplankton, zooplankton and bentos. And the flatfish is somewhere somewhere between. But then we apply the apply the statistics telling about the regime shift and adapt changes in a time series. And we found that there is a shift between the high productive and low productive period of the of the ecosystem. So and that happened in the 1973. So let's say mid 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 70s. Then we analyze both of the periods separately to see if in this those periods we have a different structure. And yes, we have a different structure. In a historical period starting in the 1925 and finish in the mid 70s, there is a different different relationship between the flounder and and benthic variables, which means that this happened something in a, in a system which changed the changed the changed the dynamic. If we compare to the to the current system, we very nicely reproduce uh, reproduce the uh, regime shift described by uh, Melman in one of the studies from cod to the sprat dominated period. However, the interactions of the of the benthic variables with with flatfish community is different. In every of these periods, uh, one of the major role play the eutrophication, but also the other stuff, the other factors. And that's what we found about the controlling factors. In the past, of course, eutrophication and nutrients play a major role in the changes in the environment. However, salinity and fishing on fla or flatfish or flounder being found as a significant factors. In a more recent period, starting in the mid 70s, that's of course productivity. That's that's changing everything. But of course, then salinity is not appearing as a significant factors, but oxygen play a major role for a number of a different different compartments. So let's start to describe every every part of the of the system. So first we have flounder dominated period, flounder peak period, so to say. And this is this this period of time is characterized by the high flounder. That's why this flounder being so high. It's different studies. We basically describe the ecosystem here. So flounder is high, uh, cod is relatively low, system is oxic, and the connection between the uh, and the fisheries mainly affect the flatfish community. It's a lot of seals as well affecting the ecosystem from top down. However, the basis, so the, the, the background for the, for the entire food web as a phytoplankton is low. So the system is relatively small in, in terms of the biomass. And then flatfish and flounder collapse, probably the very first example of overfishing in the Baltic. So the flounder is low, but still it's a good conditions uh, uh, in, terms of the, in terms of the oxygen and the eutrophication increasing. And we call this period reference ecosystem. Why? It's purely, uh, purely practical reason because it's a relatively long period of time, relatively low configuration of the system where none of the ecosystem compartments, none of the groups are blooming. And then we jumping to the high productive period where the eutrophication really hit and increased the, increased the biomass of the system. At the same time, between the 70s and end of the 80s, there was a very good oxygen and salinity condition because high, uh, high inflows from the, from the North Sea or saline, out of, uh, saline and, out and oxygenated water. And that time, the ecosystem being supported by the primary production, very efficiency, and especially cod being, uh, being supported by benthic and pelagic pathway. So through bentos, like this way, and through the pelagic through sprat here. And then, uh, then cod collapse because of the low inflows and high fishing pressure. And system switch still to the very productive period, but to the sprat dominated period where the cod, sprat and pseudocalanus interaction play a major role and keep the system at the, uh, at, the, uh, um, at the current state, so to say. We can, of course, think about the, the bentos interactions here, which are 
uh, which are maybe not lost, but they are much weaker. And we know right now that flounder is increasing. When the flounder is increasing and this connection of the cot with the benthic foot is weaker, it's very possible that flounder is competing with cot about the, about the benthic foot. There is also one thing which have to be mentioned, that very low, uh, very low level of the seals is of course one of the effects, but this is probably not the effect of the food web configuration. We know that the uh, seals been low because of the hunting and the pollution. And however, it's still huge change in the in ecosystem because the entire trophic level been very much, very much reduced. So to summarize that, we have a system which been low and oxic and highly productive, hypoxic and uh, and steer and, and regulate by the, by the salinity and oxygen, and salinity in the past and oxygen, oxygen right now. And of course, the overall biomass of the system and the configuration of the, of the system changed. And to come back to the management implication. That's of course, we have to think about the shifting baseline syndrome, described by Daniel Pauly as a, as a syndrome where we used to refer to the degraded state of the system. In a Baltic case, it's an opposite situation. As a reference system, we used to refer to the, uh, to the 1980s, which been like perfect ecosystem for fisheries and for, uh, for uh, system productivity working very well. But that was the extraordinary state of the system. And I'm not sure is it the perfect, uh, perfect uh, reference period for, for a management because it could never happen again. Well, so we have to think, do we going back in the past and refer our environmental policy to the system which are, we've been in the past, or are we basically setting a target where we would like to be? If you would like to have uh, more details uh, about the data and studies we used, please find uh, the paper uh, at the limnology and oceanography, uh, and I will be happy also, also answer questions. Thank you very much. That's uh, really fascinating. And uh, do I understand correctly that uh, the, the work that Eva did and people who are doing that kind of work is one of the components that went into this bigger study, looking at the bigger picture? Oh, absolutely. This study is just a peak of the mountain of the entire background work done by uh, first starting in, at the sea doing the monitoring, then doing the understanding of the system, some analytical work, then modeling, and then there is, uh, uh, there is understanding of the system. When we have the understanding of the system, we can, uh, based on the understand mechanism, we can reproduce what was in the past. Hmm. And also, do I understand correctly that there's like different time lags between when, when uh, something is done human activity and then when you notice changes in the sea? Um, uh, and also, if you would start to do the right thing, that it would take some time for the for the sea to respond in a more positive way. Oh, absolutely. That's if we look even on this study, it's quite clear that ecosystem response time is completely different in the decades mm -hmm. than, for example, single single fish stock, which is years, or for example, uh, months. If we if we if we refer to the single organisms, for example. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we've uh, gotten a couple of questions that have come in already. Uh, and one is, uh, uh, to what extent can uh, ecological regime shifts in the Baltic be anticipated or even actively managed through human intervention? Uh, and which organisms would be responsible for such an approach? Uh, Eva, would you like to start with that? Um. Uh, okay, so the first question was, can we anticipate uh, regime shifts yeah. in the Baltic Sea? Um, I would say that we can never forecast the future. Uh, the future is always unknown. We can do different kinds of scenarios to see possible futures. Uh, and I think what is really important for management is that we really, we need to look, uh, as was done in this study, for example, and as is done in monitoring by Helcom, uh, that we look at the many different parts of the system. Uh, and kind of as an early warning signal, we can see that if there are changes on many different levels, then we know that, okay, now we are going into something new uh, and then we can act accordingly. Uh -huh. and yeah, I'm, I'm fully agree, we cannot predict the past. 
uh, we cannot predict the future, we cannot really predict the past. We can reconstruct the past, mm. but still, it's still only reconstruction, right? We need the data to, to confirm that. But if we have a good understanding of the system, we can actually do uh, and act in a way that we can anticipate or manage the, the ecosystem. S ecosystem have a, some threshold. The tr we necessarily don't know the threshold, but historical study can help us to setting the threshold. Mm -hmm. That's a one thing. The other thing is that the, if we can manage the, the, the regime shift, we can manage the pressures on the on the le, on the, on the, on the marine environment. We can manage fisheries. We can manage nutrients. We can manage partly climate change. So not really the regime shift, but we can manage those pressures to keep the ecosystem at the level we would like to. And when you say thresholds, that that sort of implies that instead of um, change happening continually at the same speed, then like there can be sudden shifts or. Yes, and yeah. this is the Baltic is the best example of the ecosystem which can change rapidly and with the abrupt changes. Mm -hmm. So there is no continuous change. It's basically changing rapidly from year to year from and it and it can be completely different configuration. Uh, sort of like the famous ketchup bottle that pressure builds up for a, a time and then suddenly something happens. Yes. And, uh, yes. Aye, aye, aye. Okay. Uh, another question that came in is, uh, would it be helpful or even possible to aggregate data on the history, the current status and the future forecasts of the Baltic food web into some kind of open access decision making tool for uh, researchers, for policymakers, managers, fisheries, other stakeholders? Um, um, I would say that uh, uh, Decision support tools uh, need to be uh, made for specific decisions. I don't think we can have one general tool for everything. Uh, so we can make different tools for different uh, purposes. Uh, and one example, I think, from the Baltic Nest Institute here at the Baltic Sea Center is we have the Boltsam model that I have also been working with. Uh, and this is really an ecosystem model that has been used, for example, for the Baltic Sea Action Plan to calculate the target nutrient levels. So how much nutrients can the Baltic Sea sustainably take? Mm -hmm. And then this was apportioned to the different countries uh, and actually made into a political agreement or, or goals. So this is one example of, of, of uh, such a support tool. Mm -hmm. uh, the other approach, I mean, I, yes and no, of course. Uh, I, the other approach is uh, really design to decision support tool. And these kind of tools exist. They are exist in a form very easily accessible and used by non-scientists. So they are designed for managers. They are designed for the stakeholders. They've been created in a co-creation process with, uh, with the stakeholders. So in a way, how they would like to see. Some of them, uh, one of for the Baltic, uh, as far as I know, been created in a project future, uh, in a pro project Barre frame, and the other for the Blue Webs, they are addressing a bit different questions. They are addressing uh, different management processes. Yes, but they are they supposed to be also available online. Okay, that's good. Uh, mm, we'll see if we can uh, do something about uh, how to find them. Uh, uh, maybe put some links in uh, after yes. the after the webinar. That's great. Uh, Macha, another question that's come in here uh, to you is what's happened after 2005? Because you're, that's when your study ended, I gather. And I sh actually, I should address that to both of you because you're also a co-author on that study. Um, the reason why our data ends in 2005 hmm? is because we have to be consistent with a data series and available data series to perform the analysis in every trophic level. Mm -hmm. Of course, we can, we can extend this. But if we use, for example, it's better for, for this kind of study to look at the current period, it's better to use the data from monitoring, as Eva said. It's, it's much more reliable, and this is the observations. So we can actually say what's happened. And then it's better to look at this, for example, Melman studies, which he, wh where he's base, uh, basically using the, the data data, mm -hmm. not the reconstructions, but really observations to, to analyze ways in a similar way. Okay, good. Um, a kind of a, a, a standard question that we that we ask is, uh, so sh such a short time after Christmas, 
we're still in, in that kind of a mode. Uh, if you would uh, send a wish list to the Santa Claus of management, <coughs> uh, could, you, what, what, could you mention one thing that might be on your list? Uh, I would say the one thing that's really on the top of my list is, so both of these studies and many others also use this long monitoring series to see what happens in the ecosystem. Uh, and taking these, for example, these bent examples is quite laborious and quite uh, expensive. Uh, and there has been talk that maybe we can go, maybe we can have fewer time series or maybe we can go every other year to save money. But I would say that these are really, this is really the data behind uh, finding these uh, changes in the system. So I really think that, I really hope that we can continue with this long time series and also continue them uh, in a comparable way so that we use the same methods. This would be my number one on the wish list. <laughs> okay, and much Is the Santa Claus accept two wishes? Y well, sure. So yeah. the, the, the first You one can always ask. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. <laughs> uh, the, so the, the first would be use the integrated approach to manage the Baltic Sea. So not manage eutrophication separately, fisheries separately, climate change separately. Do the manage the integrated management of the of the of the Baltic Sea. Mm -hmm. As an example might be uh, start to using the, the ecosystem based uh, advice for fisheries or take into account the fisheries when you manage the when you manage the uh, when you manage the nutrients input and eutrophications mm -hmm. because that of course have uh, implications as mm -hmm. we as we saw in the study. The other one is just follow the ICES, uh, follow the ICES or HELCOM or generally the follow the uh, science advice for uh, for 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 uh, for management because it's quite often lost somewhere in the process. Okay, well that's a a, a, a good message. Uh, let me see if there's any other questions. Uh, okay, yeah, here's uh, another question that has come in. Is um, uh, oh boy, a couple of ones. Um, how can we best manage the lag between when we see a shift uh, and would need immediate management and the much delayed response by the management bodies? Is it possible to reduce the response time? And when we're talking about time, we don't have many minutes left, so we have to be short on that. Uh, Eva, do you have a suggestion? Um, I would say uh, I'm more of a researcher and I, I really can't say how to uh, make management more efficient. It may be much I mean, with time. this, uh, it will really help uh, the modeling studies. Oh. It will help in that way that if we will have a simulation scenarios and we know what could happen under a different under different scenarios, we can be prepared by strategic actions and having the, the, the ready strategy for ecosystem management, it will help speed up the process for the management. Okay, thank you. And another question that's come in, is there any specific kind of monitoring data that is missing uh, that would help to understand the ecosystem better? For example, data on certain levels in the food web? Yes, uh, with my food web studies and food web modeling studies, I'm mostly missing uh, the data about the mysids. About the what? Mysids. That's a, that's a, uh, that's a small, a, a bigger zooplankton, so to say, pelagic, benthic, uh, species which sometimes live on the bottom, sometimes live in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a water column, but it's a, sometimes it's a, ma it's a one of the main food components for herring, for example, but oh. it's a very little data about it. Mm. I think this is a typical example of how we often compartmentalize. So we have the benthic researchers and the benthic monitoring, and then we have the pelagic monitoring, uh, and these kinds of semi-pelagic species really fall uh, in between the cracks. Between the cracks in, yeah. the, in yeah. the marine science. Yes, <laughs> yeah. in a way. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, something that uh, uh, I would just like maybe leave you with, and that's mm -hmm. like uh, if you would uh, put on your wish list a question that you would like the management to ask. Um, we don't have many seconds to deal with that, so maybe I might have to just leave that hanging. But if you have like a very quick response, what would you like to see the managers ask science? that they ask about the fishery science in the ecosystem context. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, that's Fisheries a good one. Uh, and uh, our time is uh, up now, finished. Uh, we'll be meeting again at the next Baltic Breakfast uh, on the 17th of 
February. Uh, that's a Thursday uh, at 8.30, back to the normal time. And there are a number of researchers at the Baltic Sea Center, your colleagues, and I'm not sure if you'll be there because I don't know that much about it yet, but we'll be commenting on the recently adapted, adopted uh, Baltic Sea Action Plan. So we'll see you again uh, on the 17th of February. And thanks for today.